Please help me welcome Mr. Gary Mefford. All right. I love the 70s theme. I mean, I, I, was, uh, I turned 10 in 1970. That was, the, that was my decade. I loved it. And, um, you know, it, I, I want to say, it, how many of you remember a show called Monty Python's Flying Circus? All right. So now for something completely different. But before I start talking about BCV, I got a couple things I want to cover. One, uh, for those clinicians, those respiratory therapists that have been at the bedside through this COVID pandemic, um, you know, I've known my whole career. I, I started working in hospitals at age 16. I saw those respiratory therapists running by to go run the codes. I thought, that's the greatest job in the world. And I've known my entire career. We, as respiratory therapists, are the, the heroes of healthcare. We are the ones that show up when nobody else will and do things nobody else will do. We can fix anything. We're, we're the smartest ones in the building. I've heard that so many times. That's why, you know, it, that's why I'm an RT. That's why I still am an RT. And so I, I want to point out that for those of you that were at the bedside, you are the heroes of the heroes. You're my heroes. I've, I've been, I got to sit out the pandemic making marketing material. I, I feel my, kind of lucky in a way, but I feel like I was, I was left out of something that was important, and, and you guys carried the load, and I really appreciate that. We have something here that I wish would have been, been available prior to or would have been known better, but... Um, Time will come. But I want to take a second and just think back about the 70s, because I think a lot of people don't remember it very well. You know, there's an old saying I think I've heard before. I can't remember for sure, but I believe it went something like this. If you remember the 70s, you probably weren't there. <laughs> okay, so for me, the biggies, movies, Rocky, oh my gosh, the, the, the Academy Award winner was 1976. What a game changer for, for everybody, man. We were all flying high after that. Um, one Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, I uh, love that movie. Um, there was also a kind of a crazy film that came along, kind of kicked off a disco move. My, I had a friend named Barbarino that was on a show called Welcome Back, Cotter. Anybody remember Welcome Back, Cotter? Up your nose with the rubber hose, come on. I, I made it a career. Um, and Barbarino took on this disco dancing deal, and that was another big movie, uh, Saturday Night Fever. But... Um, I remember something that I think has, have we've really lost. Remember Anybody remember when Saturday Night Live was still funny in the 70s? All right. <laughs> but, um, you know, so we, I'm trying to think what do I got. I made some notes here. I can't really read them. But, um, oh, yeah, we had, we had some fun times. The crisis in Iran was at that time. Um, things that, that, you know, have changed quite a bit. There was no cell phones. Can you imagine a world without cell phones? Nobody had a per personal The only person that had a personal phone was Barbie in her dream car. I, no, I never knew anybody else that had a cell phone. There were no PCs. It was not a computer. Nobody had a personal computer. No respiratory department, no hospital. They weren't there. There weren't computers. How did we get along? Another thing I think about, and I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure uh, Michael Jordan hadn't brought them quite along as far as they eventually came, but I don't remember Nikes. I don't think Nikes were in the 70s. We had Adidas, we had Converse, but no Nikes. And I, then, then I had, you know, thinking about uh, this getting ready, I kind of had a debate with my wife. When did bell bottoms actually become popular? I remember a pair I wore in the late 60s, but boy, the 70s sure perfected that science. Um, and then also, no Facebook, no social media, and we liked it. <laughs> there was no voicemail, no email. How did we get along? All right, and you remember the, the commercial that would come on every evening about 7 o'clock? Do you know where your children are? It's like, what the heck? Where are we supposed to be? We're, out, you know, we're playing until the lights go out. You know, we stay outside and run around. Anyway, and there was another weird commercial, and those that weren't in the 70s may not remember this, and I don't know if it was a cautionary commercial or what, but I don't know. Anybody remember Calvin Coolidge was the 20th president of the United States? It came on every, like, Every other commercial. What was, what was that about? And then some of my favorite things as a kid in the 70s. Anybody remember clacker balls? <laughs> you didn't have facial trauma from them. It was a little fun game we played until they exploded. Um, and then Tommy Smothers gave us the state of yo. Yo-yos were a really big thing for us in those days. Because, of course, we didn't have cell phones to play with. 
anyway, so I want to kind of launch into what I got to talk about. Um, the, you know, I don't know. <laughs> maybe you guys have experienced this or maybe you haven't. But have you ever discovered something that you were so excited about you just had to drop everything you were doing and tell the world? Well, here I am 11 years in. This is something that is, to me, is the future of respiratory therapy. I, like, like the guy said, I mean, I'm all about outcomes. My whole career, I wanted to do a better way. I wanted to find a better way to make things happen for my patients. And I know I've found a better way. So it's just it's a matter of people learning about it. We need to get more research on it. But as time goes by, you're going to find that this unique, although seemingly antiquated intervention is an extremely powerful tool in the hands of competent respiratory therapists. So let me start out. Um, this was kind of how it went for me in 2006 at AERC when I first discovered BCV. And we're not getting any sound out of this. I don't know if we need to fix that before we go any further. But. So that was sort of how it was for me. It was like a, you know, I thought I had discovered the holy grail of respiratory therapy. There we go. And I really believe I have, even still. The things that I'm seeing happen with this device every day and more and more all across the country and around the world just floors me. As we see more and more use of uh, EIT in our ICUs, EIT verifies recruitment so clearly. And this device where they're using EIT in Europe, is um, we're getting such great information back. So um, it's something to really get excited about. But let's take a second and talk about biphasic cure ventilation, or BCV. It falls under the umbrella of negative pressure ventilation because it uses negative pressure to create lung inflation. We always hear, well, you're like the iron lung. Well, yes, in the fact that we do use negative pressure to create lung inflation, yes, we're like the iron lung. But the iron lung did not have the same cardiovascular benefits that our device does. Our device pulls blood back to the core and increases preload, recruits the lung, and reduces uh, right ventricular afterload. So the iron lung did none of those things. Iron lung caused venous pooling in many of the patients that were in there because there was no cardiovascular benefit for the patient. So what BCV represents is a form of non-invasive ventilation that utilizes three basic modes for support, continuous negative, control mode, and respiratory synchronized. All right, good. All right, well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> so it, uh, respiratory synchronized, those are the three main support modes. It's also a lung recruitment tool. And we can provide high-frequency chest wall oscillation with our device, uh, airway clearance for airway clearance, and it also has a cough support. So it provides high-frequency chest wall oscillation through the cure off with a negative and positive pressure above and below a zero baseline. It's not just squeeze, squeeze, squeeze like a lot of devices. It's pulling and pushing. So the therapy is a much more open lung therapy. I don't know how significantly different that is as far as results. All oscillating airway clearance devices mobilize secretions. Uh, modify the secretion somewhat so they can be brought up, but few of them convert into a cough phase that helps the patient expectorate. And I always say, why break it up and bring it up if you can't have it coughed up? So that's a big benefit of our device. It actually helps the patient to clear completely. It's also an adjunct. This is a curos ventilator. The face, the trachea is not utilized. So you can use BCV as an adjunct to invasive positive pressure ventilation. You can use it as an adjunct to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation to other modalities such as ECMO, high-frequency fre high oscillatory ventilation, um, high-flow oxygen, and heliox. So it can be an adjunct to other therapies. It can enhance the results of other therapies. It can lower mean airway pressure on positive pressure ventilation, allow a decrease of PEEP, which in, uh, improves venous return and protects the lungs. So there's a lot of uses for this device that may not be an originally, you may not think of right off the bat. So RTX. This device was made for respiratory therapy. The name means respiratory therapy external. This is a tool for respiratory treatment. It's non-invasive. And when you consider the risk benefit of the interventions that you apply, this is a very low risk intervention. Air is being moved in and out of the lungs naturally. And we'll talk about that in a second. Some people say natural and they're using positive pressure. Positive pressure is unnatural inside the thorax, except with a cough or a salve maneuver. So um, it's very low risk, but the benefit, as I ho hope I can demonstrate here in this discussion, is extremely high. We have a, a really high rate of success with this device in many, many different types of pathology. And then we're gonna, today's discussion is primarily going to be looking at 
some information on BCV, the physiology of how it works and why it works a little bit, and uses of the device, mainly case studies, mixed case studies, and articles we're going to go through. So this talk is ta called What Does That? BCV Does. So it's a little bit of an audience participation thing. I don't know if you guys are all awake enough for this, but we'll try it out and see how it works out. But uh, when I say what does that, then the answer is BCV does. So it's non-invasive support. It's effective non-invasive lung recruitment. What does that? Yeah, OK. OK, so BCV does. Now, th there's a few more things than those two items that I would like to bring to everybody's attention. And these are things I want you to think about when you think about a Curos ventilator from now on. It's not just the old iron lung thing. This is a tool for respiratory therapy. It reverses atelectasis like few therapies can. Our body reverses atelectasis naturally with a negative pressure. We take a nice deep breath, atelectasis is reversed. Our patients are often too weak to do that for themselves. We have a device that can help with that. You've got a patient with post-op atelectasis, won't take a deep breath. BCV is a great tool for that. Helps with air leaks. That's another one. That, that's, that's one that has constantly amazed me. There's multiple citations about patients that had persistent air leaks, multiple chest tubes. You apply BCV, continuous negative, and it'll help heal those air leaks. And we'll look at a case for that a little bit. Uh, it's a non-invasive tool for support. So you have all the benefits of non-invasive. It's going to produce less infection. And the cool thing about this form of non-invasive support is your patient can be fully supported. You can be clearing the CO2 for them, improving their oxygenation, and they can still talk to you. They can still participate in their own care verbally. They can still eat and drink and take food and fluid naturally. Very important elements, particularly in certain diagnoses, BF, et cetera. No mask. Patient doesn't need a mask. The device can ventilate them fine without a facial interface. Patients can eat and drink, as I said. It can be an adjunct to positive pressure. To me, its best trick is somebody who spent so many years in an LTAC. This device is an amazing tool for patients that are difficult to wean. Weaning failure is quite frequently a rap onset of a rapid shallow breathing pattern as the patient's weakness leads to loss of their FRC. If we can apply just continuous negative to their chest during the weaning trial, they've been failing maybe serially for days, all of a sudden they'll go for hours because we're maintaining their FRC and that weakness doesn't set in and that rapid shallow breathing pattern doesn't set in and we've got many cases where patients who have been pronounced unweanable were able to be weaned in short order with this method. So, oh, and then it's a non-invasive lung recruitment tool. It's an amazing tool for recruiting the lung. Improves the PDF ratio, and we'll see some of that in a bit. Improves pulmonary compliance. As we increase the FRC, that decreases resistance to the airways. I always tell people I can diagnose asthma in a conference booth. If you come into the conference booth and I put you on my machine and you go, oh my gosh, I can't believe how easy it is to breathe, I'll go, you have asthma? And nine times out of 10, the answer is yes. I, I'm surprised at the amount, the level of work of breathing that some people are walking around with because when you relieve it, they can really tell the difference. And it does that acutely for, for patients with asthma and bronchiolitis extremely well. Increases the patient FRC. What does that? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so in critical care, we've got some critical problems that we want to creatively deal with. I mean, these things are, are there. We, we need to figure out what to do about them. First of all, care of patients with cardiopulmonary compromise is resource intensive. They don't call it an expensive care unit for nothing, right? Care of patients with respiratory failure requiring supportive ventilation requires them to lose the ability to speak, eat, and drink in most cases. Positive pressure ventilation is not physiologic. Everybody knows that, right? It's not physiologic. Our body is not meant to have their lungs inflated with positive pressure. So it's not physiologic, and when used unnecessarily or misguidedly, or even sometimes as carefully as possible, it can radically worsen the outcome. Ventilators in the wrong hands are deadly machines. Both invasive and non-invasive positive pressure ventilation can have significant related side effects that increase the intensity and duration of use. They actually make themselves worse. Now, everybody up here has probably seen these kind of images. I don't want to leave them up there too long, but facial interfaces invite problems. And for kids that, that have the, the altered facial structure, it's, sometimes it's really bad. So this is a paper that looked at complications of non-invasive ventilation. You guys might have seen this before. It's a pretty comprehensive look at some of the complications. And 
what some of the findings that, that I kind of took from this, nasal lesions, like the image we saw a minute ago, account for a large portion of NIV complications, up to 30 percent, depending on the paper. Non-invasive positive pressure intolerance may affect as much as 50 percent of patients, and despite the best efforts of skilled caregivers, discomfort remains responsible for up, a, up to a third of NIV failure. So then we have intubation, positive pressure ventilation, and trach. These are amazing, life-saving, and preserving interventions. I made a large share of my career out of learning and understanding how to best apply these interventions. But I still got to admit, um, you know, some of the things that we did, uh, I worked at one site where uh, every male got a liter tidal volume and every female got 850. I don't know why we had to put chest tubes in every day. It just seemed like a strange thing back then. But um, these interventions come with a very high risk level. Intubation, when you take and put a tube past somebody's vocal cords into the trachea, you bring the risk level from here to there. So many more things can go wrong, so many more things can go bad, and many times they do. Infection risk has increased dramatically. We all know when we cross the cords of that tube, we've just opened the lungs up wide open to all types of infection. VAP is just, you know, it's a normal thing a lot of times. Communication, the patient can't talk to us. And what kind of stressor is that to suddenly be made mute? You don't even realize it's happening, and all of a sudden you wake up and you can't talk? No wonder they need to be paralyzed. So there's a lot of uh, strong indications for endotracheal intubation, and this is just a list that came from, from a website. But patients that require intubation are said to have one of these five indications, inability to maintain airway patency. That, uh, that needs pretty much immediate attention. We better get them tubed. Patient has inability to protect their airway against aspiration. Probably the same thing. If, they, if they're aspirating and we can help them with a, with a tube in, then we need to put it in. The others, however, failure to ventilate, failure to oxygenate, anticipation of deterioration, aren't always as immediate. And in many cases, we can intervene before we have to jump all the way to that tube or that mask. And that's what I want to talk to you all about. Okay. A lot of com complications can come from endotracheal intubation. Tracheostomy has its set of indications, kind of similar, but uh, one of them is long-term intubation. So then we'll trach those patients. Tracheostomy even has a longer list of potential complications than intubation itself. And, but so I, I want to talk to you about a paper that, that I'm, I'm kind of excited about. It's been out for a while, but it was called Non-Invasive Negative and Positive Pressure Ventilation in the Treatment of Acute on Chronic Respiratory Failure. And in this paper, they looked at 258 patients with acute respiratory failure on chronic respiratory disorders. They were able to ventilate 77% of them with what they called non-invasive ventilation, which included negative pressure ventilation and uh, also non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. But the interesting thing about this paper was if they failed to be able to avoid intubation with either modality, they would switch them to the other. So it, what, turned, what happened was patients for whom negative pressure ventilation or non-invasive positive pressure failed, they switched. The f group that failed negative pressure ventilation was about 23.4%. If they failed, they switched them over to non-invasive positive pressure, and 8.8% was the failure rate at that point. So single-digit um, failure rate for, for treating respiratory failure. And then if it was the negative pressure group, uh, or the positive, non-invasive positive pressure group that failed, they were switched to negative pressure and the intubation rate went down to 5%. They also found a benefit to mortality, which has been seen with BCV in, in other studies. So their conclusion was using negative pressure and non-invasive positive pressure, sequentially, it was possible in clinical practice to avoid endotracheal intubation in the large majority of unselected patients with acute respiratory failure on chronic respiratory disorders needing vent support. The sequential use of both modalities may increase further the effectiveness of non-invasive mechanical ventilation. And in some cases, using them together is a good answer as well. We've had patients that just embraced having the mask and the continuous negative and the control mode with, with BCV. And we, we even have patients at home that are using both. I have a patient that has a severe, or not that severe, but we can, we can fit her, but she has a, a, a scoliosis and a, a one side of her chest is kind of collapsed in. If she doesn't have negative pressure on her chest every day, she winds up with atelectasis pneumonia and in the hospital. But she also has OSA. So each night she wears continuous negative and she wears a BiPAP mask for her OSA. And it keeps her out of the hospital. That's what keeps her well. 
this paper, negative pressure ventilation in pre pediatric critical care settings, had some interesting findings. Negative pressure appears to be a promising modality to deliver non-invasive ventilation for a selected group of pediatric patients. Potential benefits include reduced airway complications, improved pulmonary parenchymal hemodynamics, thereby reduced cardiovascular compromise, decreased sedation requirements, and improved internal nutrition. Those are common findings where they're using this device. This approach could drastically reduce the cost incurred in treating patients on more invasive modes, which in turn require invasive monitoring in the ICU as well. This was a, a, an interesting paper that looked at BCV in, at two different facilities. One facility had it and the other did not. And they wanted to determine whether the use of negative pressure ventilation associated with a lower rate of endotracheal intubation in infants with recurrent apnea secondary to acute bronchiolitis. So the inclusion criteria for this paper was bronchiolitis so severe the patient was demonstrating apnea. In that group of patients, some interesting findings were 52 patients that they looked at, and there were, um, they used, on five of the patients, they used negative pressure to actually wean them from positive pressure. But you see that only eight at the negative pressure center required positive pressure ventilation versus 18 out of the 21 at the non-negative pressure center. So 26 versus 86% of the patients required intubation. The median days on positive pressure for those that were intubated and placed on positive pressure was three at the negative pressure center versus five. That's two days on the ventilator, two more days for something to go bad, something to go wrong that we're seeing. And then the other finding, which to me probably has the most dollar value, the median length of stay in the PICU between the two groups was two versus seven, five ICU days. There's hospitals that are advertising their ICU stays at the tens of thousands of dollars per day. So that's big money saved. So what's all this mean? It means to avoid complications, we need to use every safe means we have at our disposal to avoid the use of these high-risk interventions of mask, ET tube, or trach. Patient stabilization without intubation, whenever possible and safe, will achieve that. So we want to stabilize the patient's lung in a recruited state, pre and, if necessary, post-intubation and post-extubation. The curos will actually hold the lung in an open state. And there's been some interesting papers that show as long as we can maintain adequate FRC, it's very difficult to create lung damage. And that's what BCV does for these very sick patients. It normalizes the patient's FRC. So we have something uh, at Hyatt we call the open lung concept with BCV. And this is basically optimizing lung volume by recruiting and stabilizing unstable airways and lung units with negative pressure lung inflation. This type of lung inflation is significantly different than the inflation pattern you get with positive pressure. Anybody hear of something called a baby lung before? Do we know what that is? Nobody? Somebody? Well, Positive pressure is very well known to only inflate the compliant lung units, usually in the apices. So the patient is only ventilating a small portion of the available lung volume because the pressure gradient to push air to the bases is too great for gas to get down there, unless you turn the patient upside down, maybe. So negative pressure gives you the most homogeneous inflation of the lung that you can get. That's why it's the way our bodies are supposed to work. And the benefits of this is improved pulmonary compliance, whether the patient's intubated and ventilated or the patient's breathing spontaneously, we see the benefits of that improved compliance. Improved gas exchange as we recruit the lung, as we improve pulmonary perfusion, which this device helps to do, we see gas exchange improvements. And decreased work of breathing. Many people feel it almost immediately that have high levels of work of breathing. And we get a better flow of secretions. Our lung is more open. The secretion flow is, it flows up naturally and normally, and that's very important because other forms of ventilatory support can make that worse. And then we see decreased shunt and decreased dead space as we recruit the lung and improve pulmonary perfusion. So this is the most natural form of lung inflation. And I, I mean, I hear other ventilator companies talk about how natural their breathing process is. I'll say it again. Positive pressure inside the chest is not natural, ever. This opens the lung naturally. Lung inflation with a negative pressure gradient opens bronchial and bronchial pathways and pulls gas, pulls gas to themselves. 
the airways are just, they're dying to get the gas there. They want to pop open for it when it arrives. If you push it down, it's only going to go so far, and it's going to create overstretch. This supports natural lung inflation in comparison to positive pressure. And for sick lungs, it, it creates a better distribution of tidal volumes. It creates little or no chance of alveolar overdistension. When we add positive pressure to the baby lung, we just stretch it. When we add additional negative pressure, the lung finds new pathways for gas to distribute to because it's being pulled from the periphery out. It provide, produces a more open lung with a protective effect for lung tissue. So what is BCV? How does it work? How does it affect physiology? Very simply, a biphasic curious ventilator provides respiratory assistance as a non-invasive <clears throat> non ventilator and as a secretion clearance device with cough assistance. The negative pressure in the curious which is the curos basically forms a bubble over the anterior of the chest and abdomen, and that negative pressure in the curos causes the, the chest to expand and the lungs to expand with it, producing inhalation. Our device, biphasic curos ventilator, is biphasic, so it has an active exhalation. It actually, after lung inflation, it turns around and puts positive pressure in the curos and helps the patient then to exhale. What ventilator helps the patient with exhale work of breathing? There's none other. So the positive pressure helps with exhalation. BCV ventilates by decreasing and then increasing the pressure within the curos chamber, providing either continuous negative, controlled, triggered, or synchronized inspiration and expiration. So BCV equals natural ventilation. Natural breathing consists of two phases. We all know inspiration and expiration. The biphasic curos creates inspiratory flow the same way as natural breathing, pulling your chest out and pulling the lung open, and that pulls gas inward. During natural exhalation, the diaphragm and intercostal muscles relax, returning the thoracic cavity to its original volume, that's exhalation, increases air pressure in the lungs and moves air out. Exhalation, when assisted by the biphasic curos ventilator, is an active phase as positive pressure is placed in the curos, assisting exhalation just as the accessory muscles of exhalation will do for our patients when they have increased respiratory load. So here she is. Now I want to stop here for a second because there was another movie that was kind of an iconic film for me, and it, it was Star Wars. I got it, you know, and, and I do have a bit of an assertion to make here. First of all, at a place far, far away, a long, long time ago, there was an original version of this device, and it was called R2-D2, and now it's the RTX. So, you know, we don't quite get the same noises out of it. But, and the other thing I want to point out, for those of you who are Star Wars fans, you may not realize this. Darth Vader was ventilated with a curious ventilator. You ever saw that mask come off? He just has like a little oxygen blowing under his nose. He's, it's not a BiPAP. He's on a curious ventilator. That little box on his chest, that's what's going on there. Okay, it's all about restoring FRC. Okay, I found this paper called Methods of Increasing FRC in Acute Respiratory Failure. It's mainly about uh, pulmonary function information. But one of the, fi the findings in that paper that I thought was very interesting talked about the goal of respiratory therapy, which is to increase functional residual capacity. Well, this is not only to improve oxygenation, as important as that is, but also to reestablish pertinent and normal ventilation of all regions of the lung. In acute respiratory failure, ventilation is endangered by destabilization of alveoli. So apart from interstitial edema, the clinical picture will be determined by the pathophysiological consequences of increased pulmonary retraction and decreased lung volume leading to reduced compliance, hypoventilation, shunting, and hypoxemia. If we can keep the lung open, we don't have that. And this is a, an image I found, uh, helium-3 MRI, that showed the areas of contraction in a couple different types of pathology. And it, it clearly shows what's going on in our ARDS lungs. There are areas of atelectasis. It's very heterogeneous. The areas where the atelectasis is, atelectasis pulls, atelectasis draws. So it's actually tugging and pulling against the surrounding tissues, and that creates its own set of inflammation and damage as well. So that's where our ventilator can't push gas, is beyond these, these obstructions, but we can pull it there. We can apply negative pressure, and we can inflate lungs like this when nothing else will. So I want to take a second and, and talk to you guys about me and my FRC. Um, I started thinking about, and, and actually this came way before I started thinking about this, but um, I, I was thinking about what do we do to increase FRC, because I know I have a device that increases FRC, and I thought, well, how do I quantify this? Well, there's not a lot of papers out there that show me how much negative pressure increases FRC, but fortunately I had worked with a research institute in developing a study protocol 
that was to measure increased FRC during exercise and if that was protective against FRC loss, the, et cetera, et cetera. And so in that process, I had my own FRC quantified and then quantified on continuous negative of minus 20. And here are the PFTs, the, the stuff, let's see, where does this pointer work from? So these are actually body box studies. One was done with the Kiros off, and the other was with the Kiros strapped on and ready to use, but no pressure. And you can see I had a little bit of restriction that occurred, a tiny bit of volume loss with the Kiros strapped on. And then they looked at uh, Kiros on, or no Kiros, so this is just me, in their real-time measuring equipment. So they had real-time measuring equipment that was doing uh, inert gas washout, and also collecting FRC while I was using it in real time. So you can see I had a little bit better volume here with no Kuros, and then we strapped the Kuros on, the volumes went down, and here it is, the Kuros at minus 20, so the volumes came back, almost back up to normal. Um, and then, you, then we did it with exercise as well, and these are the deltas. Okay, so my FRC, no Kuros, 3.895. When we put the Kuros on at minus 20, that went up 694 milliliters. That was a 17.82% increase. That's an important number. Remember, 17.82, and if you like, round it off to 18. With the Kuros on with exercise, it was, uh, the, the increase was uh, 539 milliliters, so about 16% there. So FRCs gained with proning. That's another thing I, I needed to find to do this comparison. I found a great paper for that. Uh, lung volumes and or lung volume recruitment in ARDS, a comparison between supine and prone. In this paper, the, another element that we looked at in the same uh, kind of grouping here was a PDF ratio, and proning in increases PDF ratio, and that's, that's why we see it used more and more. Also, the FRC is increased, and here's the deltas from that study. So um, 71 millimeters of mercury difference in PDF ratio, which was about 33.8% increase with the proning maneuver. Uh, FRC increase, 175 milliliters, and 18.13% increase in FRC. Does that sound pretty close to what I got on my PFT? Okay, so this paper looked at a recruitment maneuver on a ventilated patient using negative pressure. And you can kind of see um, We'll zoom it in here in a second, but this little section here where the PDO, oh, this is PDF ratio, and you can see that significant increase. And actually, this is where we took the information from to come up with these numbers. But this is quotes from that paper. During the first application, and they're talking about the, the negative pressure recruit maneuver, the PDF value increased from 236 to more than 300. During the second application, so there was a subsequent recruit maneuver with negative pressure, the P to F ratio increased to more than 500, indicating significant recruitment of lung volume without any use of positive pressure recruitment maneuvers. Now, if you don't have to put them on their face, why would you? So here's the increase in P to F for proning, 33%. For the first negative pressure lung recruitment maneuver, just under 30%. And for the second lung recruitment maneuver, nearly 100% increase in P to F ratio with a negative pressure lung recruitment maneuver. An FRC increase, like I said, about the same. Uh, you know, of course, that's normal lungs, but maybe. I remember I said I was in the 70s. Uh, FRC increase, BCV increases FRC, and increases P to F ratio. What does that? Right? BCV does. Yeah, thank you. Here's a, a paper that looked at a dynamic CT, so a CT that was taken uh, during respiratory cycle. And what they found here was that uh, volumes of ventilated lung and atelectatic lung were measured through the respiratory cycle, and negative pressure was associated with an increased percentage of ventilated lung and a decreased percentage of atelectatic lung. And that's what these values are pointing out here. The ventilated lung, 61% throughout the respiratory cycle of the lung was ventilated versus with positive pressure, same tidal volume, 47%. Atelectasis, significantly less, almost half during the negative pressure breath cycle, where it was almost 20% during the positive pressure breath cycle. Same group, a little bit different paper, but they had a quote in this paper that I found really kind of interesting. The spatial differences were striking with dependent atelectasis persisting over most of the respiratory cycle in positive pressure. Such patterns that have previously been reported in patients undergoing positive pressure in the setting of acute lung injury, or ARDS. 
In contrast, with negative pressure, we observed a different topographic distribution in which normally aerated lung volumes were greater and atelectasis was reduced. The findings in the current study are similar to the altered distribution of lung volumes as has been demonstrated for ventilation in the prone position. I say again, if you don't have to put them on their face, why would you? I got a simple device that can help you. So we get a lung inflation pattern similar to proning. What does that? These of you does. So what does that mean for my patients? I'm going to tell you about a couple of uh, patients I've met and a couple of patients I didn't meet, but this guy I did get to meet. His name was Scotty. Scotty was, oh, do, we get, do we have it here? I thought I had it here. Where is it? talks about him. Yeah, eight-year-old male, end-stage CF, acute respiratory failure, on transplant list, severe right-sided atelectasis, mask-dependent. He had been mask-dependent for over a week when I first met him. He's losing weight because with the mask on constantly, he can't take adequate nutrition in spite of the fact that they're trying to supplement. And this was Scotty's x-ray when I met him. Dad had taken that with his, his uh, camera off of the view box that morning, the morning before I arrived. So Scotty was a... I mean, it, I don't know, you guys may have worked in, in PICUs or in pediatric care. Sometimes you get kids who have been hospitalized nearly since birth. And there's an interesting common denominator I found amongst those kids. They have no control of anything in the world except what happens inside the four walls of that hospital room. And they tend to become the tyrants of their room. I don't know if you've ever met those kind of kids, but they don't let anything happen in that room that they don't approve of. And that's the way Scotty was. Well, the respiratory therapist, apparently, who initiated the BCV treatment for this young gentleman was not very experienced with kids. He walked into the room with his equipment, plopped it on the bed, and told Scotty, I'm, the doctor ordered this for your breathing. I'm here to put it on you. Scotty was kind of like, go. That therapist was banned from the PICU until Scotty discharged. It just ticked him off. You know, he, he, he ran that hospital room. You didn't say anything negative about what he had on the TV. You didn't disrespect his mom or his dad. Whoops, where is it? Whoops, don't do that. I'm going the wrong way. Or his monkey. He was really fond of that monkey. So I knew I had to do something a little different with this guy. So I went in the room, and he was Scotty. He knew what I was here for. He had already kicked the RT out of the room. He knew he didn't want this dang thing, whatever it was. He was sitting there with his arms crossed, looking up at the ceiling. You know, he made eye contact with me for a bit. So I got down on a knee next to the bed, and I started talking to the monkey. I said, look, the doctor sent me down here with a thing that can really help Scotty's breathing, and you can get that mask off. And I have a video on my phone of the very first time it was ever used. Would you like to watch that video? And Scotty had his arm around the monkey, and I saw the monkey's head go like that. So this is the video that I shared with Scotty. Dad was on one side of me. Mom was on the other side of Scotty. And I was holding my phone up, laying in the bed next to the monkey. Let's see if we can find our way to it. Here. You a special ventilator from England that helped to save a Jamestown man who has cystic fibrosis. As Dr. Peter Ostro reports now, thanks to that experience at Children's Hospital, the machine could save many more lives. A few weeks ago, Tyler Blake went home from Children's Hospital. He had suffered a very serious complication of cystic fibrosis, and he might not have survived. But his physician, Dr. Joe Cronin, received special permission for him to become the first person in America to use a new ventilator, the Hayek RTX. And I was at a point where um, I couldn't get any worse, basically. He came to me and asked me if, if, it, would, if it would be something I'd be interested in, and, and I said yes. The machine was flown in from England. It works by encasing the chest in a shell hooked up to an air pump that can produce either negative or positive pressure on the chest wall. That moves air in and out in a natural way. The effects were almost immediate. I felt a difference right down in the x-ray showing it. Short difference within 12 hours. He's the only American who's used it. The success was dramatic, and today Children's Hospital Ray, announced that the Food and Drug Administration has cleared the Hayek ventilator for further use in the United States. Tyler spoke to the group from his home. How are you feeling today? I feel great. Feeling really good. The ventilator will be useful for many other respiratory conditions, and Dr. Cronin credits the company, the hospital, and the FDA. I'm very grateful that everyone cooperated so uh, beautifully in order to bring this patient this opportunity, which he would not have had. 
I, I certainly look forward to using this device more here at Children's Hospital in, in a greater number and variety of patients. Now, this new ventilator will probably be very effective for people with severe asthma, emphysema, and several other serious breathing problems. We don't know that for sure yet because it hasn't been tried, but now that it's been cleared by the FDA, doctors can start using it and collecting the evidence that will prove its value. And it's really nice to know that Children's Hospital played a role here. So Dr. Cronin is now our medical director. He is probably more passionate about BCV than I am, uh, if that's possible. Anyway, he, he loaned us these slides so I could share them with you. This is about, this is the slides regarding the first use of VCV in the United States on a uh, end-stage cystic fibrosis patient with recurring pneumothorax. Uh, Tyler Blake was a 26-year-old pancreatic insufficient male with CF and severe lung disease. His previous FEV1 had been recorded at 33% of predicted. He was out playing golf with his family in July of 2008 and developed sudden right-sided chest pain, increased shortness of breath. They took him into a little hospital in Jamestown, New York, and they really didn't know what to do with this advanced CF patient, but they did try to put in a, a, a chest tube. So he was transferred from there to the floor at the, uh, on the adult CF unit at Women's and Children's of Buffalo in July 8th of 2008. They started his uh, medications. They removed the chest tube that had been placed at the outlier site and put in a larger chest tube that actually evacuated his lung or his, uh, his, his thorax chest tube was noted to be interparenchymal uh, two days later. So he got his, what, third chest tube then when they took that one out and replaced it. Went to water seal about five days later, looking good. 24 hours later, we pulled the chest tube. Well, about a week later, worsening dyspnea, chest pain, pneumo's back. And here's Tyler's x-ray shortly after admission. You can see the Whatever that is, it looks almost like a feeding tube they got in there, uh, but he definitely has a significant right upper lobe pneumo. So the complete right pneumo, chest tube, 24 French, placed at bedside. So there's another chest tube. He stabilized. They attempted the blood pleuridesis. They went to water seal about three days later, thinking everything was going to be okay. Took the chest tube out the next day. Lung dropped again. So they placed a Furman catheter. A Dr. Furman apparently works up there in Buffalo somewhere. It's, to me, it's like a, other things I've used that sort of allow the gas to just kind of leave the lung. They placed that into the right pleural space. Uh, and other adjustments to his antibiotics. They did a nuclear scan, found out he had crappy perfusion on the left and kind of crappy perfusion on the right. They did a, a VATS procedure and a bleomycin pleurodesis and a bleb resection. Well, we found out shortly after that that he developed a BP fistula in the area of the resection. They extubated him on August 4th to try to lower the pressures and decrease the gas flow out of the leak. This is not your normal extubation gas, but that's what, that was his gas the mor morning before they extubated him. It's a little acidotic there, possibly, and a little hypoxemic, um, and more medication adjustments. Okay, so. He had some problems. He was, had respiratory distress any time they took the mask off of him. He had a weak cough. He wasn't clearing his normal volume of secretions. His CO2 levels were rising above 70 any time he had the BiPAP off. They weren't able to DC it in any way. He couldn't take PO. And when a patient is hypermetabolic, like a CF patient, they need PO. He's minimally communicative. He started becoming less and less responsive. His chest X-ray, however, hadn't changed very much. He was counseled that his condition was serious. You know, with the, we know those discussions when we talk to the patients about these things. Maybe it's better off if we just kind of wind this up. And he wasn't improving. His white count was rising. Uh, his, his nutrition status was compromised, even though they were replacing calories with hyperal and gastrostomy feeds. On August 6th, Dr. Cronin brought up the idea, since he had... He was aware of this, and he had talked to other doctors who had used it around the world. So Dr. Cronin asked if Tyler would like to try this new, very unique, and really essentially unused in the United States intervention, and Tyler agreed. Dr. Cronin's rationale for this was that BCV provides an external respiratory assistance that augments efforts of both phases of the respiratory cycle. It's biphasic. It's not solely a negative pressure ventilator. And that's the difference between this and the old-timey negative pressure ventilators. This active expiratory phase allows this device to generate much greater minute ventilation than you can with passive exhalation. So 
So it's capable of providing external chest wall oscillation, also assist with airway clearance and assist cough flow. The patient was having respiratory distress any time he was off of positive pressure. He was having an ineffective cough, and his sputum was creating a buildup, and manual CPT and NEBS weren't getting it done. The persistence of the pneumothorax and bronchopleural fistula with the ineffective sputum evacuation was not being helped by positive pressure. No further surgical intervention was recommended. The surgeons wouldn't touch this guy. Now, here we have uh, the x-ray that occurred just prior to discharge there on the right. You can see that lung is not in the greatest of shape, but it is fully inflated, and there's not any tube in the, in the, uh, the, inside the thorax there, in floral space. So on August 21st, they increased the pressure to minus 35. That increased his tidal volume. He was using BCV continuously. On September 2nd, the last chest tube came out after using BCV, now what, for a couple weeks. He was taking CPT with the Curos. He was using BCV during sleep and then graduated to just using it during sleep and with CPT. And then finally was able to tolerate more and more time off of BCV. And on September 19th, he discharged the home on two to three liter nasal cannula with a transplant eval set up for him. This was posted on the Clyde Health website. That's the Buffalo General and uh, Oshai Children's website. Within 24 hours of this treatment, initiated three weeks ago, Tyler's lung function improved dramatically. He was successfully weaned from the BiPAP device, which immediately allowed him to eat solid foods and sleep more comfortably for longer periods. Within two weeks, previously necessary medications were discontinued and his chest tube was removed. This immediate dramatic improvement in Tyler's condition is a direct result of treatment with BCV. So back to Scotty. We finished the video. And I, you know, as respiratory therapists, many of you probably have the same thing. You've got crystal clear moments from throughout your career when, you, when you've done it 40 years, you've got these moments to look back on. And, and one of them was this moment with Scotty when I'm holding the phone up for mom and dad and Scotty to watch this. And Scotty, who is a country boy, an all boy, just because he's in the hospital doesn't mean he's not masculine. He, he, every monster truck driver in the country knew Scotty personally. He had posters and pictures and the sign. He was a, a big fan of monster trucks and NASCAR. And he was definitely a southern boy. And so we, we, I held that phone up, and the video ended, and Scotty goes, Daddy, he has CF like me. I think it can help. Well, my heart just broke right then. I saw Scotty. This is Scotty before I got there. We wore this thing overnight. Dad sent me an image of the x-ray the next morning. I was, I was in the airport. I was leaving town. I had to go home that day. I had to sit down. When this came to me, that's the next morning. That's the same kid's chest the next morning. No other intervention. There wasn't a bronchoscope involved in this. This was just negative pressure lung inflation. When you have a, an unbalanced pathology like that, you try to recruit that lung with positive pressure, all you're going to do is stretch the crap out of that good lung. You're not going to do anything. Negative pressure draws gas outward in all directions. It will reverse atelectasis when nothing else will. And here's Scotty. Mom sent me this probably about two weeks after I left. Scotty had been eating huge meals every day. And I, I, I meant to tell you, about, after he, he used our device and he was wearing it, the, the, the trays arrived. And Scotty hadn't eaten for over a week when I met him. And so mom had, she ordered religiously every day, she ordered him meals even though he didn't take them. Well, this day she knew if he was going to eat anything, he would eat macaroni and cheese. And so it, that's what it was. It was a plate with macaroni and cheese mounted up on it and a milk. And I remember, Scotty, the, they put that in front of him. He put that Vinny mask up on his head. The nurse said, would you like to take that thing off while you're eating? No, no. He just, and he just went, and that macaroni and cheese just disappeared. The milk went down. Mom was ready to party. She was more worried about him not eating than the fact that his CO2 was just under 100 for days. That's how moms are, I guess. Anyway, it reversed Scotty's atelectasis, and it helped heal Tyler's air leak. What does that? BCV does. So this is a paper. Gosh, I'm running short on time, guys, but I've uh, got so much to tell you. This is a paper that um, actually is a... a a Italian doctor before BCV came to the United States was following a group of SMA patients. So pa little kids, babies, a lot of them, that have a neuromuscular compromise that's similar to ALS in adults. 
They just they lose all their muscle function. One of the common denominators of that illness is they have more muscle function towards the bases than they do in the apices. So a lot of times they develop what's called a bell-shaped attitude of their chest where the apices are uh, hypo. They actually decrease in size. And so what this doctor said in his paper was among the things currently on the market in Italy, the RTX respirator differs completely from any existing ones because it combines non-invasive ventilator characteristics suitable to treat respiratory failure along with... Uh, things that can remove endotracheal secretions and are ins indispensable instruments of physiotherapy and continuous respiratory gymnastics. I don't know why Google Translate said gymnastics. But. So he felt like early intervention in situations of progressive respiratory failure, such as patients suffering from neuromuscular pathologies, can make it possible to avoid intubation and artificial ventilation in patients whose chances of detachment from mechanical support are reduced with considerable savings on hospitalization costs and better quality of life. In patients who underwent prolonged treatment with the RTX, an improvement in the structure of the thoracic cage was noted with an increase in the expansion of the apices and a reduction in the typical bell-shaped attitude. That's powerful stuff. Um, these, these children wind up with a very misshapen chest, and this actually, we've got a doctor down in San Antonio that we, we recently talked to. He's been following a girl there for about 10 years, and he says that her chest structure is nowhere near similar to her peers. So this doctor from Italy felt like this apparatus is of particular importance in the prevention of high-grade kyphoscoliosis, which occurs in these patients. So I've got a few case studies. Um, I'm going to try to whip through at least one or two here. This is a, an unweanable adult patient, 79-year-old female, post-MVC with multiple severe fractures and contusions. She'd also had ARDS. She'd also been paralyzed for nearly a month on an oscillator. Multiple failure of weaning efforts in short-term acute hospital. She was trached and moved to long-term acute, positive pressure ventilation dependent. Persisted with failure to tolerate weaning efforts several weeks post LTAC admission. Her maximum tolerance of CPAP with pressure support was only seven minutes, several minutes regarded, regardless of what pressure support was used. We started with her in the afternoon. We went in and introduced ourselves, introduced the therapy, and started her out on continuous negative in addition to her positive pressure settings. And one of the things that I always do with a weaning process is begin by putting, putting the patient on BCV as a ventilator in the biphasic mode and making sure I can set that so it delivers a similar minute ventilation as to what their positive pressure ventilator was delivering. That way, post-extubation or post-discontinuance of the ventilator, we can just kick over into that mode and support the patient until they rest and do a little bit better. We started on secretion clearance, and that went Q4 through the night. On day two, the next morning after her beginning uh, stuff in the morning, treatments, et cetera, we placed her on a secretion clearance with VCV and then began CPAP with pressure support, just like every day, normal weaning process, and continuous negative of minus 10. She quickly progressed down to a CPAP of 5, pressure support of 10, 40%. That was sort of their jumping off point to a trait collar. Um, she had no changes in vital signs during that process, which had the therapist sort of floor because they had never been able to get her past 10, 15 minutes um, on CPAP and pressure support. By 10 a.m., she was on a trait collar. She had no signs of intolerance at that point. All monitored variables were stable. Continuous negative continued at minus 10, and she was on a trait collar with only 40%. At noon... She was, she was a very talkative patient, and she really had something she wanted to say to us, you know, how that is with your intubated or trach patients. Well, we had her off of the ventilator, doing well. The therapist said, why don't we try a speaking valve? We did. And um, I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this, but when somebody hears their voice for the first time in two months, it's a very interesting experience. And that was how it was for her. She was so encouraged and so happy to hear her voice, she almost wouldn't shut up. So, um, and that can be fatiguing, you know, that can be fatiguing. So the therapist decided that, that I was working with there that, you know, our short conversation was enough. We figured out what her needs were, got them taken care of, and then we took the valve off. But it was interesting, again, as each um, family member arrived, the therapist would go stick the valve on, and, you know, she was a West Texas gal, and just so cool. Hi, how are you? I'm so glad you came to see me today. I love you. One after another, family members nearly fainted on us because Granny hadn't said a word to them in two months. 
So we continued on continuous negative until bedtime. When she went to bed, we switched her over to control mode. She, she would get ventilatory support. She rested extremely well on control. CNEP started the next morning, and that became her routine for a little while. She never went back on positive pressure. The speaking valve trials continued to capping trials. She wound up being decannulated. Um, through that process, she just used continuous negative uh, during the day and control at night. Ultimately, she weaned completely from both positive pressure and BCV support and discharged to a rehab facility with no requirement for any means of ventilatory support, just low flow oxygen. Before we arrived, she was unweanable. This is a pediatric patient that had gone through a Berlin heart. This is a very charismatic young lady. I got to help with this one. Um, she got diaphragmatic paralysis when they put the, the plumbing for the Berlin heart through the diaphragm. A lot of times when they punch through, they'll nick the phrenic nerve. And she had bilateral diaphragmatic paralysis. They found a match and did her transplant anyway, wound up being able to wean her from the ventilator and discharged her home. A few months later, she came back with a pneumonia, secondary to severe atelectasis. There was no choice but to intubate her and put her on positive pressure. They contacted me because they weren't able to wean her. They were not making any progress. It was similar to the other patient I described. After they dropped below a certain amount of pressure support, she just couldn't take it, she, and she failed over and over again. They attempted several extubations. Each one resulted in an RRT or a code being called. So they were advising a trach and a long-term vent at the facility, but the family refused. So they contacted me. And this was interesting to me because I had been there to visit the, the site about a month before, and I was toured through the CVICU by the medical director, and he told me, we have an average length of stay here of 1.3 days. He was very proud of that. Well, this young lady had been in their ICU for about six weeks. It was an entirely different relationship between her, her family, and the therapists and the nurses than their normal patients. She was on CPAP of 5, pressure support of 10. We had her on continuous negative of minus 8. And shortly after that, she took a nap. Well, she's still on positive pressure, and we're still getting an exhale volume readout with every breath. And we found when she went to sleep, her tidal volume went down by half. So we put her over on control mode and set some pressures so she would get a normal tidal volume during sleep. And she did beautiful with it. Her volume readings uh, during sleep, like I said, were about half. We switched her over to control. And when she woke up from her nap, she went back to continuous negative, still on CPAP and pressure support as well. She showed no signs of intolerance, as she had every other time they had attempted to turn things down. And three hours later, the intensivist came around and said, you know what? She looks good. Let's extubate. Well, the therapist, that had the therapist, the group of therapists that had been taking care of her for some time, it was really interesting to see the blood drain from all of their faces when he said, we're going to extubate now. But I knew. I felt like, well, this looks good. Let's do it. So she was remained on continuous negative post-extubation. She took another nap. Um, when she did took, took her nap, we put her back on control, just like the plan was. Following her second nap, she was removed for, for a short period from the Curos. So uh, during that, that nap, that second nap, I had been standing at the bedside all morning, and it was past lunch now. So I, I said, I'm going to take a break. I'll be back in a little bit. Just went to get, off a cup, get a cup of coffee, and I came back, I don't know, a few minutes later. And here's this little girl who had been supine in the bed for months. The nurse had taken the curios off, and she was sitting up in bed. And there was a closed-circuit TV that was at the foot of her bed, and Baby Bop was on there boogieing. Well, here was this little girl right along with her. And, I mean, it was one of those crystal-clear moments as well. I looked around the ICU because I knew this, this girl had been here a while, and everybody here knows her. And I mean, and, and I, including me, there was not a dry eye of any of the caregivers in the ICU. This little girl had gone past something that they could not get her past before. She was in good spirits, jamming to baby bop. BCV was resumed, using continuous negative all away, control mode during sleep. Secretion clearance went on for a few three to four hours, or three to four times a day. She was then discharged about a month later to home. I got to go... Uh, down there to the, the discharge planning meeting and helped them to plan the discharger, and then was able to go back and set them up at home. And one of my fondest memories is that little girl running around the house, well, maybe not running, but playing around the house, squealing, something that mom and dad would have never had if she had trach vent. So uh, I've got several others, but I'm pretty much over a little bit on time. This is another uh, case of hypoxemic respiratory failure, a 56-year-old male. 
and he was on high settings. I'm just going to kind of jump through here. Here's his serial blood gases. This was a patient that used uh, 14 hours of continuous negative, and you can see here is the FiO2 overnight. So this is at 9:30. By 10, 30, 11 o'clock the next morning, O2 had been weaned to 60 percent. We took it off of him about noon that day, and they'd have got him down to 50 percent. So if you just take these numbers and, and calculate the PDF ratio. PDF was 64 to start with on this patient. After 14 hours of use, it increased to 177, more than doubled. That's 14 hours of use. This is another one where we had a patient, 84-year-old male with laryngeal cancer, had a tracheal mass that had caused a whiteout of his entire right lung. We used BCV. The, the doctor was actually giving me the jazz, I think, because I, I had spoke in case conference that morning. They only gave me five. The first they said, we'll give you a half hour. Then they said five minutes. So I rattled off what I thought the machine would do for some of the patients in the ICU. And this doctor right after called me over to the view box and said, well, the, the computer screen nowadays. And he, uh, he said, you think you can help this patient with your machine? And I said, well, I don't know. We can try. He said, OK, well, x-ray will be here in three hours. Well, I went in with the therapist, and we started working with this guy. We used BCV on a high level of continuous negative. We applied secretion clearance, actually two rounds of secretion clearance within that three-hour period. X-ray didn't show up until about three and a half hours later. I'm telling you, nothing else except BCV was applied. There's not a bronchoscope involved here. You don't have to be a radiologist to know, one, that's a bad X-ray image, but also that patient's right lung is back in play. And he was able to discharge off the unit, which is what they wanted. He, they wanted him to step down, and he was able to move off after we were able to clear his lung like that and improve gas exchange. This one um, allowed a patient. This, this was a very dramatic one to me. It was an ALS patient who had been uh, on mass ventilation for several days, about 10 days. And we were able to transition him over to BCV. And he had become more and more attended the longer that he wore the BiPAP. It just wasn't clearing his CO2. He was becoming less and less responsive. So once we started BCV, we were able to clear some CO2 off. He started waking up, was able to transition him off a of BiPAP. Well, the cool thing about the active excretory phase when you have neuromuscular patients is they have weak ability to phonate. And the weaker they get, the quieter they are. Well, he could barely speak. But I taught him how to phonate during the active exhalation when the machine was pushing the air out. And within a few minutes, his speech became normal volume. His speech, he learned how to cycle. Along with the machine, you couldn't even tell that the machine was helping him. He called for a meeting with his family, had a quick meeting with his family, called for all of his doctors, told them, I know what my family's been doing. They've been wanting to take me off of this thing and let me go. He said, that's not what I want. I want to be here for as long as I can. So the doctors scheduled a trach the next morning. The day after that, he wound up in an LTAC on a ventilator. About six months later, I ran into that pulmonologist in that same ICU, and he stopped me. He said, you know what, Gary, that, that ALS patient we helped back in January, he is now at home thriving. And that really gets me, because had we not gotten him on our device, you know what would have happened? This is, oh gosh, I, I think I'm going to have to end with this one. Uh, I got a lot more one to say, those, but this is a, a video of a COVID one of patient those recoveries in Fort Worth, Texas. Texas they used our device. Maybe. One of those recoveries includes a North Texas woman who is finally home after being hospitalized for three months with COVID-19. The doctors and nurses at Medical City North Hills call her recovery a miracle. Our Caroline Vandergriff shares the 24-year-old's remarkable story. A standing ovation for Paula Castillo as she left the hospital today. For the past 79 days, she's been fighting for her life at Medical City North Hills coming back on and off. There was a point where they didn't know if I was going to make it or not. After testing positive for COVID-19, she spent more than a month in the ICU on a ventilator and in a medically induced coma. The 24-year-old says it had never even crossed her mind she could get the virus. Maybe if I was just less than to wear a mask, just a simple thing, I would have avoided all this. Uh, since I work at a bank, I'm always around people. And so I was like, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. But never, never did I thought I would catch it. Doctors at Medical City North Hills say they're seeing more and more young patients contract the virus. The COVID unit here has been nearly full for the past six weeks, and staff are exhausted. We've seen so much negativity. We've seen a lot of patients die in our hospital uh, that were in her situation. That's why Castillo's story gives them so much hope. 
it kind of re-energizes you and gives you that sense of um, what it means to, to save someone's life and to help someone overcome such a severe illness like this. Her road to recovery is far from over. She's probably had months and months of rehab. But Castillo is grateful for her second chance at life. It's just a miracle that I'm, I'm alive and I'm still fighting and I want to keep fighting until I get better. In North Richland Hills, <laughs> Caroline Vandergriff, CBS 11 News. I'm glad she is home. They were able to get her off of the ventilator, but she couldn't wean from BiPAP. She couldn't discharge until she got off of it. BC was brought in and they were able to have her off of BiPAP in about three days and then she was able to advance to discharge. Um, this is a patient uh, we already talked about. We do have some exclusion criteria. There's some reasons that you might not want to apply BCV, but there are very few. Um, most patients, it's worth a try. Fitting is easy. We have different guides for fitting, and we have a comprehensive training program. So what we have here is something that's better for patients and better for healthcare systems. Not only does it help improve patient outcomes, but it also saves a lot of money as we shorten time in ICU and time on vent, et cetera. So these are some of the many indications for BCV. And back to our critical problems, BCV offers the clinical intervention that offers the most effect against costly respiratory problems as a means of non-mass, non-trach, non-invasive ventilatory support to height can be used very effectively to treat hypoxemia, hypoventilation, with many benefits not provided by positive pressure or non-invasive positive pressure, including improving cardiac preload, protecting fragile lung tissue. BCV can also be used if a trach is present with the same benefits. Routine use of the HIAC as a means of improving chest wall range of motion, pulmonary muscle strength, lung volume expansion for weak patients. With the combination of that high-frequency chest wall oscillation assisted cough is superior to any single or combined therapeutic intervention for assisting pulmonary secretions up from the lower airways and providing a means of coughing them out. This highly effective airway clearance and cough assist, as well as the therapeutic benefits of negative pressure and BCV provided by the Hyatt combined in a single device with multiple uses offer a strategic means of decreasing the recurrence of pulmonary infection, shortening hospital stays, and dramatically decreasing cost of care for patients with pulmonary compromise. So reverses atelectasis, helps air leaks, non-invasive support, no mask, patient eats and drinks, adjunct to PPV, weaning tool, non-invasive lung recruitment, improves PDF ratio, improves compliance, FRC. What does that? BCV does. All right, come on, clicker. So critical problem, potent solution, open lung concept of BCV. Thank you very much. Any questions? Maybe one. Online, um, it says, what age range is the device approved to work with? Wouldn't there be airway collapse with negative pressure in young children prior to full hardening of the thoracic cage? If you're concerned about upper airway issues, to go ahead and, and put, bring them to the lab and test them. I mean, if that, that's a concern. Uh, but really, it's amazing that we don't have that many problems with airway obstruction. The size of patients we can treat is the size that we can fit in the smallest cure house, about probably three kilograms, two and a half kilograms. We have heard of places adapting it to even smaller children. Um, and oftentimes, continuous negative. And I'd say acute care, probably about 90% of the use is continuous negative. So there's no additional impetus for airway collapse with continuous negative than there is with, with the spot being free. So, yes, thank you for that question. All right, thank you very much. Oh, we got one over here on the wall. Yes. We, we want everybody to adhere to standard aspiration precautions. So if your patient's high risk for aspiration, you, have, you probably have about the same risk using BCV as you would otherwise as long as you're following your normal aspiration precautions. And carefully, if you've got excess residuals or the patient stops digesting, you want to get that out of their stomach. Uh, also, we recommend um, doing secretion clearance after bolus feeds or meals instead of before, probably similar to what you're doing with your normal CPP treatment. Okay, I better get going. See you guys later. Thank you very much.